if I forgot to ask. Um, okay, we're we're live now. So we're gonna go for um, another 45 minutes. Um, all right, hello everybody. This is Yusuf and Azam, and we have been joined on Psych Bad Tech by my mentor in logotherapy, Dr. Anne Mary Neal. Uh, we're very happy and excited to have you on the show. Welcome on Psych Bad Tech, Dr. Neal. Wow, thank you so much, Yusuf. It's so glad to be, I'm so glad to be here, and it's so great to see you almost in person and oh. to join your radio. I don't know what you call this is a podcast or a Facebook podcast or yeah, it's, a, it's a Facebook live. <laughs> all of the all of the above, right? So, all of the above. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, you asked me to, and I guess I'll just share what comes to my mind, right? Sure. Yeah, uh, that's what it is. <laughs> that sounds good because that's what I usually love to do. Well, I was asked by Yusef, who, yes, is my former student, but now colleague. I keep telling him he's a colleague. He doesn't have to keep addressing me as Dr. Neil, although he continues to do that. Uh, and uh, Yusef- He's stubborn. <laughs> he's just stubborn. <laughs> he is stubborn. I have kept telling him. I finally, I keep, ans I keep writing emails, putting Anne Marie, I get back Dr. Neil. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, and I used to live in the South and, and some of my students and even some of my students from uh, Europe will call me or South America call me Dr. Anne Marie, which is kind of like a, com uh, a, a hybrid of, of my first name and, and my, the fact that I do have a doctorate in clinical psychology. So anyway, uh, uh, yes, I, uh, I am um, uh, honored to be here to talk about one of my most favorite topics in the world, which is Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. Uh, and to tell you a little bit about why I find it meaningful and what the theory is all about. I'm going to assume that some of the people who might listen to this later, because I understand this is being recorded and people can click on it another time, might've read Man's Search for Meaning or maybe hadn't read Man's Search for Meaning, maybe just heard of this man and know that he was a psychiatrist who survived uh, three, uh, at least three, four, possibly four concentration camps during World War II. But uh, so I'm gonna assume that you know nothing about logotherapy and share with you, with you what I know and what I understand about his amazing philosophy of life. I call it a philosophy of life, a theory of therapy, uh, and, a, and somewhat of a theory of personality. Uh, but, I think that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a wonderful beginning. Uh, most of our audience, most of the people who will be listening, they've heard me or Azam refer to Frankel now and then. They know that uh, we uh, take to logotherapy that I've uh, been I, I talk about logotherapy and Viktor Frankl every now and then. So they've some of the people have heard the name, and, and you're right in assuming may have read the book. But this is the first time that we're going to be dedicating an entire podcast slash Facebook Live slash YouTube whatever it is that we're doing uh, to just talking about him. And um, so that's it's a good place to start. Well, no pressure there. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Neil, uh, yes. I think the question would be, what the heck is logotherapy? <laughs> what the heck is logotherapy? Well, that's a great place to start. Um, I probably, however, um, and I will tell you, just like I said, it is a theory of therapy, a theory of personality, and, and uh, a theory of a philosophy of life. And what logotherapy is, and uh, is from Viktor Frankl's perspective, he, uh, as a very young kid, even when he was 13, 14, uh, challenged teachers who would say, well, life has no meaning. And he would say, well, if it has no meaning, why are we here? Uh, and so he was always fascinated by a philosophical theories as a young kid, as a teenager. And then when he went on to college, university, got his he, uh, his uh, doc, he is a, was a physician, an MD, with a degree in psychiatry and neurology. And then when he was released from the concentration camps in 1946, he went back to University of Vienna, which is where he's from. He's from Vienna and got his PhD in philosophy. So what is logotherapy? He, um, 
he chose that name. He, he played a lot with different names of what his theory was. And he finally came back to logotherapy because he wanted to separate the fact that he was not just another ex, he, he didn't want to use the term existential analysis in English because it was being used by others such as Rollo May and, uh, and Ben Swanger and others. So he decided to go back to the term logotherapy. Uh, and the word logos uh, can mean the word, but it could also mean meaning. Uh, and so he wanted to, he was looking at why are we here? Why are we born? What is our, the reason that we are here on this earth? And he believed that uh, there is meaning to be discovered in our universe, that we have uh, the will to discover meaning for ourselves. And very importantly, we have the free will to do so. So that's in a nutshell, what most people think of when they think of logotherapy it is the philosophy of life and the, the psychotherapy therefore follows that philosophy that there's meaning to be discovered, to be discovered by the way, not created. He did not believe that we create meaning. He believed that we discover it and it's external to us and it is individual for each of us. So for, for example, right now on this broadcast, this is a meaningful moment for me and for Yousef and for D Dr. Asim, for all of the people who will be listening, each of us to discover what the meaning is in this moment for them. And so it's meaning of the moment and ultimate meaning. So meaning of the moment is basically what we do every single day of our lives. Every day we get up, there's something that's going to happen that day or something we're going to discover that will be meaningful. But he also believed that there is this concept that he called ultimate meaning, which most people would call God, but some people might consider it the universe. A scientist might say it's scientific principles. You know, uh, it's, it's something greater than us that we are, he believed, striving to reach through uh, all of the acts and the behaviors and the decisions we make in our life uh, and that we'll never know how close we come to ultimate meaning to the point of death or beyond. So basically we're looking at meaning of the moment. He isn't even so much as looking at what's the meaning of my life because that's such a huge concept. And frankly, that changes over time. So for me, you know, uh, when I was a young mother, that was my primary meeting. I was, I was discovering meaning through being a parent and that creative gift. When I was a nurse, I went to nursing school first out of high school. Then I discovered meaning through working in the operating room, through working in cardiopulmonary nursing, orthopedic nursing. Uh, and then of course, as I gradually moved into other phases of my life, now I discover meaning in the moment through being a grandmother, through uh, the work I do for the Victor Frankel Institute of Logotherapy, teaching the courses that Yousef took. Uh, and I also teach uh, for another institute called the uh, Graduate Theological Foundation, and I supervise doctoral theses, and uh, I teach e-courses, and I work for a forensic neuropsychology team in Miami, and I write up reports and interpret uh, testing uh, to discover hopefully mitigating factors that will uh, affect the judge and the jury when they're making decisions, important decisions such as sentencing and even the death penalty. And frankly, Frankel says life has meaning to the last breath. So every single moment of our life has meaning. And if you, you can't possibly see it too well, but if you look behind me, there is a painting on my wall and it says life has meaning to the last breath. And I wanted to record this in front of that because that's my favorite Viktor Frankl quote. And one of my students, whose name is Dr. Lou Story, who's a social worker is also an artist. And for his diplomate in logotherapy, he didn't wanna use his so, uh, social work work. He wanted to use his artistic work. And so he uh, created 12 amazing pictures like this that depict logotherapy and turned it into a calendar, which was pretty awesome that year. 
And without my telling him, this was my favorite one because I just love that quote, life has meaning to the last breath. I thought this was an absolutely beautiful depiction of that, but I didn't want to influence him to choose that one of the 30 that he made. So I never told him. And oh, about a few months after he received his diplomate, I had this knock on my door. I was living in Florida at the time. And I went out to the front porch and there was this gigantic package and I opened it up and here was this beautiful framed uh, original drawing of and painting an artistic representation of, of my most favorite one. And when I thanked uh, Lou for it and told him that I had never shared with him that this was my favorite, he told me that the entire time he was creating it, he was thinking this is for Anne Marie. So there is such a thing as synchronicity in this world, which uh, is, I think, really powerful. So this is, when I moved to Boise, Idaho, that went in the back of my, of my car. There was no way I was going to ship it and worry that it might get lost or damaged. So <clears throat> life has meaning to the last breath. That's one of the uh, philosophies of Viktor Frankl in, in his ways of looking at meaning. He also, says that we can discover meaning three ways. We can discover it through our creative gifts, which I've just already mentioned, uh, what, some of the things that I do. Uh, and the reason, by the way, I'm feeling so happy about doing all those is that I have a big birthday coming up Thursday. You can all wish half Friday, a happy 75th birthday. And I don't know how in the world I got to be three quarters of a century old, but I am, and I am still, I am so grateful to, um, to uh, the, what I call God, but we can call it whatever, that I have my cognitive abilities and my, that I can still share my creative gifts with others. And I know all of you are gonna be doing the same thing and are doing the same thing. So we discover meaning through our creative gifts. It could be the work we do. It could be our career, it could be volunteer work, it could be raising children. We um, discover meaning uh, through our experiences in the world, our love for and from each other. It could be our love for one particular person or the love we experience from one particular person. Frankel was blessed to have two wives in his lifetime. His first wife, Tilly, who sadly died in the concentration camps. Uh, and I could go on and on about the amazing relationship they had. Uh, and then when he met his second wife, Ellie, uh, when he had not been out of the camps very long, he met her. And that's an amazing, beautiful story in and of itself. And they were married 50 years before he died in 1997. So our love for from others is another way we discover meaning. We also discover meaning through our appreciation and love for art, such as this, uh, beauty, nature. You know, we discover meaning through our experiences. So through our creative gifts, through our experiences, and last but not least, uh, through our attitude in the face of unavoidable suffering, inescapable guilt, and death. And he doesn't mean just our physical mortality, though of course that is always with us. Uh, he's talking about death in a, perhaps a, a metaphorical sense, such as death of a relationship, death of our physical health, a uh, death of a loved one, uh, uh, death of a lifestyle through this entire pandemic. We as a, all over the world have, to, have had to adjust uh, and realize that the life as we knew it uh, is gone. And even as we are moving into another phase, everything's different. So we discuss, he believes we're here to discover meaning and we discover meaning through these three ways. And I'll just keep repeating, creative gifts, experiences in the world, through love and for, for and from others, love of art, beauty, nature, and attitude in the face of unavoidable pain or suffering, guilt, or death. Now, one of his famous quotes is, um, because he calls these acts of faith, if I can't change the situation, I can always change my attitude. And so one of his famous quotes is, suffering ceases to be suffering once it discovers a meaning. And I always want to qualify that by saying he is not suggesting that we don't suffer. 
he, there is real grief and sorrow that we experience in life. Life isn't good or bad, it's good and bad. There's dark, there's light, there's sorrow and sadness that happens. Things we can't control. Um, uh, you, a hurricane, I used to live in Florida, so I know about hurricanes. Hurricane comes through and you've lost your house and you've lost every single thing in it. Uh, but luckily your family's alive or perhaps you've lost a loved one you know, through, uh, through a natural disaster. Um, he was in a concentration camp. He could not prevent what was happening there, but he did have the freedom to change his attitude and to do what he could for his fellow prisoners, which is what he did. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, and also uh, guilt, unavoidable, inescapable guilt. There are things I've done or haven't done that I might feel guilty about. Now I can't change the past. I can't change what I did or didn't do, but I do have the freedom to change my attitude and perhaps do something different. And, uh, and of course, as I've already said, death is inevitable in many, many ways. So he is not suggesting we don't suffer. He's not suggesting we don't grieve when we've lost a loved one, but how do we discover meaning in that? Uh, and um, I'll give you an example that he uses in his book, The Will to Meaning, which is the only book that was originally published in English. It's based on a series of lectures he gave here in the US. And um, at the very end of the book, he talks about the fact that people always say to him, would say to him, how could you find meaning in suffering? How could there be meaning in suffering? And he relates the story of uh, a, an Israeli artist who I don't know if he's even still living today, but his name was Yehuda Bacon. And he, as a young man, was in concentration camps in World War II. And when he got out of the camps, he started telling everyone he knew about his experience and what had happened. And he was very discouraged and very frustrated and even angry at times because nobody seemed to care and nobody seemed to change. And he was just distraught over this. And then years later, uh, he looks back on his life and he says that he finally realized what it was. Suffering has meaning if it changes you for the better. Does it change me, my suffering, has it changed me for the better? You know, how does suffering change us for the better? So it's suffering has meaning if it changes me for the better in some way. Have I grown through that suffering? Um, have I become a better person? Frankel believes that the reason we're here is for self-transcendence. We're not here for self-actualization. Although I would suggest that when I do practice self-transcendence, meaning I give of myself to others in the world. Life is asking of me, what are you going to give to the world of your gifts? You are unique. If you don't provide, if you don't fulfill that meaning that you're here for, no one else will do it. Someone else will get on this uh, recording and they will share their idea of logotherapy. Someone else would have taught you Seth the courses that he took with me, uh, uh, but it wouldn't be me. So what is life asking of me and uh, am I answering the call? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's, and it's all about giving of myself to others in the world, which he calls self-transcendence. There was a, a famous inaugural address by one of the presidents of the United States, uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, and one of the famous lines of that speech was, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And if you change that quote and insert the word life, this is what Frankel would say, ask not what life can do for you, ask what you can do for life, because life is asking us to answer that call. And I would say when I'm self-transcended, when I'm doing the things that I, uh, the, discovering meaning in the moment and then being a good grandmother, being a good teacher, doing the best I can with my friends, um, answering a call to be on this, what I consider early morning here in Boise, you know, part of my discovering meaning, then I feel self-actualized. You know, I think self-actualization comes through self-transcendence, but that's not Frankel, that's Dr. Deal saying that, uh, because Frankel disagreed with Abraham Maslow that we're here for self-actualization. He believed we're here for self-transcendence. 
Um, he also, by the way, and this is a part I almost forgot to mention, he says we have, well, I'm going to put this way, he says we have three dimensions. We have a spiritual dimension, we have a, a soma, which is a body, and we have a psyche or a mind. And he was talking about the, the spiritual, what makes us spiritual beings different from, say, animals. So he was not talking about a religious concept when he was talking about uh, the spirit, excuse me, this human spirituality. He was talking about what makes us distinctly human. And in German, there are two words for spirit, uh, a religious uh, word and a secular word. And he deliberately chose Geist because he wanted to talk about the fact that we have this spiritual dimension. He then tried to, use, but it was not a religious concept. So that if you had a religious crisis, you would go to an imam or a priest or a rabbi or a minister. But if you wanted to get some help with your psychological problems or your mental health problems, you would go to a psychiatrist, you would go to a therapist. As he said, he was a healer of people's mental health. Uh, he was not uh, a savior of souls. So he, when he talks about spirituality, he's talking about in a secular term in a human sense. And I happen to be blessed uh, to be friends with now and colleagues of his grandson, uh, Alexander Vesely, who learned a lot from his grandfather about logotherapy and is a logotherapist himself. And one time I said to Alex, we have a spirit, a soma and a psyche, a, a spiritual aspect, uh, which is uh, in Greek, the nuos. And we have uh, a, a soma, which is my body and my mind, which is my psyche. And Alex stopped me and he said, no, Anne-Marie, that's not what my grandfather said. He said, we have a soma and a psyche, but we are spiritual beings. So it's a, we are spiritual beings on a human journey. That's what he was talking about when he was talking about this new oath. So, but what, what does this new oath or this spiritual dimension contain? Because to me, this is the most awesome part of his theory, even perhaps for me, even more so than I'm here to discover meaning. And he said, in, in this spiritual aspect of who we are, we have amazing gifts. For example, the defiant power of the human spirit. I will overcome when a hurricane has come and destroyed my home and all. I will somehow get past that. Um, I will find the strength to overcome the death of a loved one, the death of a child, uh, uh, some physical illness uh, that I might have discovered, such as I, uh, I just discovered, this is not true about me, but suppose I just discovered I have, had, had multiple sclerosis. Or suppose I've struggled with addiction and I finally realize I don't drink, I can't drink normally like other people, which by the way, was part of my experience in life. How do I, um, uh, I overcome that? Well, he believed we have this defiant power of the human spirit. We also, he said, in this amazing human spirit, we have our creativity, we have our intuition, we have our uh, personal conscience which was not what Freud talked about, our superego. It, it is, yes, the things I've learned as a child from my caregivers or parents, perhaps my religion, perhaps my culture, but it's also my understanding now of what uh, my values are. And that that's part of my personal conscience, which is in our noetic spiritual dimension. What else is in there? My ability to forgive others and myself. And also sense of humor. He believed that the sense of humor is extremely important. What I love about this idea that in our spiritual dimension, as spiritual beings, we have all these gifts that Frankel says the spirit is incapable of getting sick. So I could be physically ill. I could be struggling with anxiety or depression or bipolar disorder or a myriad of psychological uh, conditions. I could be um, in, in intense grief. Uh, I could have all of those things that I'm struggling with through my body and my mind, but my human spirit, all these gifts that are in there are still there. It's just that I can't always reach them. 
I like to think of it like, cause I used to live in Michigan also, and there's a lot of fog in Michigan. And if you're driving in the fog, if you've ever found yourself suddenly in the middle of driving in the fog, like I have, you can't see anything in front of you. Uh, I couldn't see the road. I couldn't see the side of the road. I was driving just because I knew what was there. So when I am struggling with depression, when I'm struggling with grief, when I am in physical pain, perhaps, uh, uh, when I can't figure out what the meaning of life is right now, and I'm going through what he calls existential frustration, um, all these gifts are still there. I just can't access them right now. But when the fog lifts, suddenly there they are, and I can access them again. And to me, that is the most one of the most hopeful aspects of logotherapy, that we we are in cap that our spirit is incapable of getting sick, that we have all these gifts there, uh, and that we will be able to access them once perhaps we get the help we might need from say a physician to cure my migraine headaches, perhaps from a recovery program on alcohol or drug addiction or gambling addiction or all the addictions that we suffer in this world. Uh, when, I, when I am able to finally come to terms with my grief over the loss of someone, perhaps through a counselor's help or a life coach's help, when I go to a psychiatrist uh, for help with my bipolar disorder and I agree to take the medication perhaps that will help with that, or I go to a psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker to get help with struggling with the different aspects of perhaps intense anxiety or depression, that once I can get that taken care of, all these gifts in the noetic dimension are there again for me to see and grasp and hold. And I don't know about you, but I used to get migraine headaches. And I can tell you, I had no sense of humor. I did not feel like forgiving anybody. My creative gifts were out the door because the headache was just all consuming. But once the headache was relieved, I was able to reach these gifts again. So I, I honest, and again, in service to others, not about me, always in service to others. And I can't think of any other personality theorist that talks so much about self-transcendence and makes such a big deal about it. To some extent, Alfred Adler did, who was another Viennese um, psychiatrist. He believed that the mark of a mature adult is a person who has what he called social interest, caring about their community and the world around them. And Frankel uh, was a uh, a colleague of Adler's for years, and there's a lot of similarities in his theory. Um, so, uh, um, so anyway, when I talk about the fact that logotherapy is about discovering meaning and accessing these gifts, and then I talk about all these other conditions that need help, uh, it reminds me that Frankel always said that logotherapy is usually an adjunct to other therapies. That means that sometimes someone might need to see uh, a psychiatrist for medication. Someone might need to uh, use other uh, 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 techniques like, a, like a CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. He wasn't saying that logotherapy was the only solution. And sometimes people aren't ready to talk about discovering meaning. They're struggling with very real issues and they need some other kind of help as well. So um, I don't know, I've been talking an awful lot and I could just go on and on and maybe I should stop there and just see if there's any other questions or things that you might wanna ask me that I could clarify. Thank you, Dr. Neil. That was a very wonderful introduction, I would say. Uh, Dr. Neil, uh, we in Pakistan, we live in very tight knit families. And a lot of the time uh, we hear, uh, people hear from their parents or uh, from their uncles and aunts that you have you have a good job, you have a good wife, you have a good family, you are doing everything good in it, your financially and your family. And yet you say that, you're, that you feel that your life is meaningless. What is the problem with you? Uh, so uh, there have been, uh, 
people are being ridiculed if they say that um, i feel my life as meaningless if they have the a good job and a good family but somehow they have a void in themselves that i'm not feeling myself so how do we respond to that well um thank you for the question uh frankel frankel talks about i mentioned this briefly earlier he talks about um existential vacuum and he talks about existential frustration which comes before existential vacuum and existential frustration is kind of exactly what you were just describing you know i have all these wonderful things in my life you know i have my health i have my grandchildren i have like you said my you have this family this great job why are you not satisfied why are you not happy what's going on and um and, and this existential frustration this inability to somehow discover meaning even when everything else seems so great uh is not something new this has been going on for probably as long as we have been alive on this planet um uh, for example when frankel first discovered his theory came up with this theory it was not in the concentration camps as many people think he lived his theory in the concentration camps he developed logotherapy in the 1920s uh, when he was working with suicidal young men who had um, been uh, soldiers in the world war one uh, he also was working with a lot of suicidal women in a, a mental health ward that he was in charge of uh, and what he discovered was that they were having this great difficulty discovering that meaning in the moment and meaning in life and that's when he came up with his theory so um, what he would, if I were a logotherapist and you came to me with that problem, this is what Frankel would suggest I do. He would suggest, um, first of all, there's two technique, two, two or three tech basic techniques of logotherapy. One is paradoxical intention, which wouldn't really fit this example. One is de-reflection and the other is Socratic dialogue. So de-reflection is, um, a technique that Frankel discovered when someone is hyper reflecting on something like I can't, I can't figure out why I'm not happy. I can't figure out why not, nothing's going right. I know I have all these wonderful things in my life. What is wrong with me? He would say, um, he would not say try to think about something else because I don't know about you, but if I try to think about something else when I'm obsessing about something, all I'm now thinking about is the fact that I'm trying to stop thinking about what I'm obsessing about. So he would suggest you perhaps go out and do something like maybe go volunteer at a food bank or uh, take a jog around the block or, or um, take a walk, exercise. This sounds minute, but it is true that um, stop a muscle, stop a thought. You move a muscle, excuse me, stop a thought. It is almost impossible to still be depressed and anxious if we're, if we're active in some way, or we get out of ourselves and go do something for someone else. So that's one thing he would, he would talk about. But the other thing is that he would use, it's called Socratic dialogue because Socrates, of course, every, most people have heard of the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates. Socrates came up with this kind of dialogue um, in which you ask open-ended questions in order to help someone discover the, the answer that they're seeking inside themselves. But the truth is Socrates didn't really use this dialogue for that reason. Socrates was a teacher and he wanted his students or his political uh, dissenters, those who didn't agree with him politically, to come up with his, to agree with him on something. So he would come up with questions that he would hope would kind of force you to almost be, be put into a corner where you had no other choice but to agree with him. So interestingly, the way we use Socratic dialogue isn't the way Socrates was using it. He had a, he was a very, very, big plan in his head. I would like you to see that the earth is really round. You know, I would like you to see that this political position is the best of the two options. So what is Socratic dialogue today and how is it used in logotherapy? Um, another term that you'll often hear 
uh, uh, Socratic dialogue called by logotherapists such as myself and Dr. Raza is uh, myutic dialogue. M-I-E-U-T-I-C comes from the Greek and it, and it, uh, and in the Greek, uh, it, it means with midwife. Well, what is the role of a midwife? The midwife is responsible to help the mother bring forth the baby that's already in her. So the role of the logotherapist is to be a facilitator, to truly believe that the answer to your dilemma is inside of you. It's inside your noetic dimension, but you can't see it right now. You, you're in that fog that I was talking about uh, where you can't come up with it. Nothing's working. You can't figure out how to discover meaning right now in this moment of your life. And so my role uh, would be to ask certain questions, open-ended questions that would perhaps help you come up with the answer, bring forth that baby that's inside of you, that, that solution that's inside of you uh, by active listening on my part and by not giving advice or not trying to direct you in a particular way. So let me give a concrete example. Suppose um, your family, um, they're all physicians and everybody thinks that that's what you need to do, but you don't wanna be a doctor. You don't wanna be a physician. And so you're struggling with that because you've got all this pressure you know, from family members to be that physician. So my role would be to help you come up with what you really wanna do. And I'll give you an actual real life example. When I was living in Florida, I used to, we used to get paper newspapers, right? That came to the front door and we're sitting on your step. Now we just click the computer and we've got the e, e version of the, of the paper. But back then we used to get these paper editions. So I pulled the paper out that morning and on the front page of the paper in Plant City, Florida, from Tampa, which is where the paper originated, was a picture of a woman leaning against a big semi-tractor trailer. And the headline read, former family physician becomes long distance trucker. Now that definitely caught my eye. Whoever wrote that headline knew you were gonna read that article, right? So I read the article and it was about a woman in her late thirties who had been a family physician in a small town. She was the only doctor there. She was struggling with Medicare and all these insurance company things and overloaded with patients because she was the only doctor and she was not happy. She was extremely uh, depressed and, and overwhelmed and decided that she didn't really want to be a, a physician. She all, at least not at that moment in her life that she wanted, she'd always wanted to be a long distance trucker. So she closed up her practice and she went to long distance trucker driving school. You have to get a license to drive those big things. And she became a long distance trucker and she was driving long distance trucks back and forth across the country for uh, delivering goods and so on. And she was very happy. So she discovered a way to discover meaning in her life at that moment by closing her medical practice and becoming a long distance trucker. So I am sure you can imagine the reaction of people who read this article or people who knew her one of the reactions was, what a waste. You went and got your doc, your MD, and now you're driving a long distance truck. You don't even need an education to do that. The other was very judgmental. How can you be so selfish? You have this gift that you can be a physician and help others, and you're not gonna do that. You're gonna do a long distance truck driving instead. Uh, and, uh, but the answer for her at that moment was that this was the way she was going to give to others in the world. So if I were working with someone who was struggling with, I've got everything, I'm not happy, I would trust that the answer is inside of you. And I would hopefully help you figure it out. Even if the answer might not be what your family or your, um, or your friends agree with. I mean, it might come up to be something that you want to do that nobody else thinks makes any sense. Uh, and, um, and it's okay once in a while to not feel completely 
um, content with things. Frankel says, we are not here to discover happiness. We're here to discover meaning. And happiness is a byproduct of doing the next right thing. So if I oftentimes drugs and alcohol are a shortcut to happiness, we often find many ways to shortcut because we're so sure we just want to be happy. Whereas if we just let that go and discover what is the meaning today in my life um, and how can I use this day to give to others. Every Sunday for two hours, my seven-year-old grandson comes over because his mother and father have things to do and his older sisters don't want to have to watch him all the time. And this has become the, one of the most meaningful aspects of my life when he runs in the door and we watch Octonauts together. And now and I learn all these things about snakes and polar bears and alligators and things I don't really want to know about. Thank you very much. But he is so excited and so thrilled to be here. And one day, I, my daughter asked me if I could have him come over for about three hours. She had something she had to do. And I had all these things on my plate. I had to finish a report. I had a, a read a student's to paper, tutorial paper, a logotherapy paper. And, and she said, it's okay, mom, you don't have to. And I almost said no, but I finally said yes. And he came over for those three hours and we had the best time. I couldn't get my password to work on my Netflix and I called the computer people and they're trying to help me figure it out. Now at this time, he's about five and he's telling me what to do. And he's, he's correct. I said, my grandson's helping me with this. So anyway, at the end of the three hours, he looked at me and spontaneously said, oh, I've had such a wonderful day. And I thought you almost missed it. You almost said no, because you thought you were too busy. So um, sometimes the meaning of the moment is just doing something as simple as that. Sometimes it's just saying to myself, I don't know why I'm unhappy. I don't know why I'm frustrated. I don't know why nothing seems to be great, but I'm gonna trust that there is a meaning for me to discover in my life right now. And I'm going to take a step back and try to figure it out when I'm ready and not let all this pressure from others influence me. I don't Thank know you. if that helps. But. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neil, for um, that response and pretty much giving us logotherapy in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> to quote from the last half of uh, the second half of Frankel's yeah, so um, meaning. Um, before we before we we have to close, um, I'm sorry we couldn't uh, manage more time. But um, one thing I would want to ask: uh, a lot of people in Pakistan, especially um, given the current global uh, scenario, the political situation as uh, it has developed, would be very skeptical of um, a Jewish psychiatrist and how his conceptions are relevant uh, for people in Pakistan, predominantly uh, culturally and uh, by practice Muslims. So they would feel that this is, um, you know, it doesn't fit. How does, um, and there, there may even be some question marks as to there being an agenda. <laughs> there is some, uh, you know, something, uh, something being attempted, um, some sort of indoctrination or whatnot. So um, would, would, does, does, does that, uh, how, would, how would we look at logotherapy in that context that it, you know, that Franco wouldn't in any way look to do anything or proselytize neither a Western nor a Jewish agenda through logotherapy? Wow, oh, that's a huge question to ask me to answer at the end. Thank you so much. I know you're one of my students for sure now, <laughs> one of my former students. Well, first of all, he always said, Yes, I practice Jewish religion, but that's my personal life. That has nothing to do with me as a physician, as a professional. Uh, that is my personal decision. And the truth is, yes, he did practice Judaism his entire life. And when he was in his 80s, he had a second bar mitzvah, which is uh, something that men often do to rededicate themselves to God. And every morning at 10 a.m., he said his Jewish prayers. However, he married a Catholic girl the second time 
Uh, and um, they raised their daughter, their, their daughter, they had one daughter, Gabrielle, Catholic. So he was very ecumenical, ecumenical when it came to religion, personally. He wanted a rabbi and a priest to marry them. Neither would agree to do a joint ceremony, 1946, not gonna happen. So they said, forget it. And they went to the city hall and, and had a secular marriage. So he would say, I am not talking as a Jewish person. I am talking as a psychiatrist. I, I don't have it with me, but one of my former students, Dr. Kenneth Ayubi, is a practicing Muslim. And he did his diplomate paper and his doctoral for his ID, his doctor in psychology, looking at the relationship between Islam and logotherapy. Uh, and when he asked me if he could do this project, I said, I don't know anything about Islam. I don't know, I can't be sure if you're accurate or not on that. So uh, in the Graduate Theological Foundation where he got his PsyD, I made sure that some Muslim faculty uh, read that part of his paper. But I also said to him, since I don't know, could you please recommend something for me to read? So he did. But anyway, what he finally came up with looking at Islam and logotherapy, and this is just him, so I'm only quoting him, okay, was that if you were a practicing Muslim, you could go to a logotherapist and you would not hear something contrary to your religion. If you were a Muslim, practicing Muslim, you could be a logotherapist because he didn't see logotherapy as in conflict in any way with the Muslim religion. But that's what he came up with through his understanding of logotherapy. The only thing else I could say is Frankel was never speaking in terms of a religious, this is not a religious theory. And that's the problem with the word spiritual in English and other languages. There's, it often gets connected to religion, but it's about what makes us distinctly human. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Neil, for the shortage of time. Uh, we will have to come to a close. It was an absolute pleasure listening to you talk about logotherapy. I was, um, you know, it was like a time travel for me, the couple of years that we spent studying all of those concepts together. I got a nice refresher today as well, and I hope um, and, that's good as well. And, and other than Yusuf, uh, at least we, uh, we could now hear authentic logotherapy. Well, and I forgot to mention, and I would really be in trouble, we're having a virtual world congress, virtual world congress, October 21st to 23rd. If you go to www.victorfrankelinstitute.org, you can find a way to register. Uh, there's early bird registration. It's a three-day conference. There's student discount registration. Uh, and uh, if you cannot actually attend during those uh, three days. Uh, it will be recorded. And if you've registered, you can download the recordings for up to 12 months. So we're going to have amazing speakers, amazing presentations, um, Saturday colloquium about people doing their diplomat project like Dr. Raza did. And so I encourage you to check out our website and to perhaps consider attending or registering for the World Congress. It's every two years. This is the first time we're doing it virtually because we just know it's impossible for people to travel uh, today. So that's it. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Neil, for being thank here you. with us and for sharing that uh, um, about the details about the cloaking. We'll definitely check that out. I'll uh, try my level best to attend. Um, I'm Polazam with me as well. I expect to see you there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't think I have a choice. All right, thank you so yeah, much. You uh, <laughs> thank you. And with that, we close. Thank, thank you, thank you for watching. Uh, but we hope this was what you needed to know about logotherapy as best as we could manage in an hour. And there is so much more that we would love to hear your questions on. And with that, we close. Thank you all. And good morning, good afternoon, good night for wherever you are in the world. It was my joy and my honor to be here. Thank you so much.